Good morning. Today is a very special day in the life of Church the Open Door. Amen? Yeah. Today is the first service in our Lorraine campus, so big welcome. Yeah. Lorraine campus, we are so glad that you are up and running and so glad you are here. And we just welcome you to the family called Church the Open Door. Because we are. We're a family of multiple churches with just, you no, know, I mean, one church with multiple campuses. And we're so glad you are here today. This is a great, great day. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, whoa, church is different since the last time I visited. Things are a lot different here. Well, you know, every church is just a little bit different. And some people are wondering, you know, actually, what is church all about? And if you ask that question, like the average person on the street, you're going to get all different kinds of answers. You might get answers like, well, it's all about religious people. Somebody might say, well, it's about, church is about just being a good person. Church is about the Bible. Church is about sermons. No, nope. church is about judgmental people, hypocrites. There's, you know, there's all these different opinions about what church is all about, and churches have different emphases and different things that they focus on. I think it's a legit question to ask, what is Church of the Open Door all about? And we are excited to answer, we are all about Jesus. That's what we are, and we're proud of that. We, you know, we're, we're broken people, we're fallen, we need Jesus, we love Jesus, we're all about Jesus, and Jesus was all about love. So this is what we wanna be at Church Open Door, a loving group of people that are reaching at, that are out, that are welcoming people uh, from every one of our campuses, wherever we are, we want to love people like Jesus because it's all about Jesus. Um, I just am convinced, in fact, a ton of us are convinced that this world would be a lot better off, don't you agree, if more people were like Jesus? I mean, it's just so simple. If more and more people were, were more and more like Jesus, wow, what a difference our world will make. So that's why we're here to tell people about the love of Jesus, to love people with the love of Jesus, to follow Jesus, because we're all about Jesus. Now, we preach from the Bible every week because the Bible is all about Jesus. If you read the Old Testament, it's anticipating, it's pointing to Jesus. You read the New Testament, and it starts off talking about Jesus, telling the story of Jesus, and the rest of the New Testament talks about how to grow in Jesus. So I want to invite you today to turn to the, a letter called 1 John is towards the end of your New Testament, 1 John, and um, I'm starting a new series today from this letter, this book. It's just a small thing. In fact, some people aren't even sure it's a letter because it doesn't say anything at the beginning like, you know, this is a letter from John to these people, like other letters in the Bible are. Maybe it's a sermon, maybe it's a paper uh, that John wrote, but it's so relevant to today, even though it was written 2,000 years ago. And I invite you to stand with me, and I'm actually gonna put this on the screen so we can all read together. Whoops, um, I, before I read that, just go ahead and stand. John wrote this because he is a pastor of multiple churches, kind of like what we're doing here today. I'm preaching to multiple churches, and John wrote this letter, this paper, this document, because some people in the church were struggling with doubts. And I kind of hinted at one of them. Some people were wondering, is following Jesus worth it? And as you're standing here today, getting ready to read this letter, I want you to think about, have you ever doubted, is it worth following Jesus? Because the Apostle John, I mean, big guy, he had people in the church that he pastored that were having major doubts, is it worth following Jesus? They were having questions about, is Jesus real? Or is he just some legend? Just to kind of get your big picture here, John is in Ephesus writing to about people, about Jesus in Jerusalem, so you kind of get your bearings here. Spain, Italy, you know, ancient times, still looks the same. Here's the square I want to talk about. John's in Ephesus writing about some guy named Jesus that the people in Ephesus never seen. And they're like, is this guy, Jesus, real? And today, I hear people ask, 
is Jesus just a legend or is he really real? And other people are like saying, well, I used to believe in Jesus. Not sure I do anymore. And then you had all these teachers that were coming up in the church that John was pastoring who were teaching different things about Jesus. Just like today, you hear one thing at one church, you hear go on the internet, you hear something different about Jesus. How do you know which Jesus to believe in? Now, with that in mind, listen to what John writes. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. This is Jesus. The one whom we have heard and seen. Whoa. We saw Jesus with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. We were eyewitnesses. And we know he is the word of life. This one, this Jesus, who is life itself was revealed to us. We've seen him. And now we're here to testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. Wow, what a statement. This Jesus, he was with the Father, then he was revealed to us, that's Christmas. Jesus has always existed in heaven. And at Christmas time, he came down, was born as a baby, was revealed to us, and we've seen him. Um, uh, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually, this is the third time he said this, we've actually seen and heard so that you might have fellowship with us. Cool idea. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Amen? You can be seated. Uh, John is writing for this simple fact. We want you to know the truth about Jesus. These people that John is preaching to, that he's pastoring, that he's now writing this letter to, they're, they're having major doubts and questions. And you might think to yourself, you, you've got to be kidding me. The Apostle John, isn't that the same guy that wrote John 3.16? Isn't that the same guy that was one of Jesus' 12 disciples? Yep, you got it. That's the guy. Every time you go to a football game or watch a football game or a baseball game on TV, you see John 3.16. That's the guy. That John. The guy that knew Jesus better than anybody else. He's now pastoring some churches in Ephesus and people are doubting, does John really know what he's talking about? <laughs> is, is, is he believable? And so John says, hey, I want you to know the truth. I actually, you know, I saw him. And some, a group of us actually saw him with our own eyes. This is the 12 disciples he's referring to. And we touched him with our own hands. He, he's real. <laughs> he's not a legend. He's not a man of story. And, you know, John's writing this letter probably about the year 80, 85. And Jesus was crucified around 30, 33 A.D. And so and then he was, you know, raised from the dead three days later and then ascended to the, to the heavens to be with the Father. So 30 to 85, we're talking about 50, 55, 60 years after Jesus has walked on this earth and Everybody who saw Jesus in the flesh has died, more than likely. John is an old guy, and for sure in Ephesus, he's the only one left living, and, and probably is the only one living on planet Earth who actually saw Jesus with his own eyes. Think about that for a second. Isn't that crazy? Now, he's in Ephesus. He's far removed from Israel. And he says, you know, I know all these teachers are teaching crazy things about Jesus and what he's like and this and that. I actually saw him. And they're saying he's just a legend because you understand, you've done your history, you know that in, in the Greco-Roman world at that time, there was all kinds of Greek legends and Greek stories and, and Roman stories about these heroes and these battles and people weren't sure whether they were real or myths, whether they were real or legend. You know, think of all the Greek gods and all the stories about, about them. And is Jesus just one more guy who's done great exploits? Does, does his story belong in one of the, the stories of all these great Greek heroes? Or is Jesus actually real? So John wants you to know, he is so real. I saw him with my own eyes. 
I hurt him with my own ears. I, I touched him. I've, I've touched his shoulder. I've prayed with him. I, when he died, I watched him die on the cross. That's not just a story. I watched him. When he was raised from the dead, he invited us disciples to touch him, to see, Am I, is he real? I touched him. This is not a made-up story. And I'm here, I'm, you know, the wheat to proclaim to you. So he tells the people in Ephesus and around the surrounding churches, and he's now speaking down through the years to you and me. He is saying, we proclaim to you. I'm one of the you along with you, hearing John say, that this one that we uh, talk about is one we've seen, we've heard, we've touched. And when I say that, what, what John is saying is that the, he's not some phantasm, he's actually human. And you might think to yourself, what, really? Is, is that a big deal? Yes, because in that day, there were people who were saying Jesus was not really hu- human, he was some God who kind of came down and appeared to be real, but if you touched him, your hand would go right through his body. He was a phantasm. He wasn't real. And nobody could prove that because nobody had seen Jesus except for John. In Ephesus, John was the only one who had actually seen him. And as he tells stories about Jesus and tells you know, these insider stories, people would literally come from miles to hear John talk about what he saw with his own eyes and what he heard with his own ears. And he kept saying to them, Jesus is not a phantasm. He's not a story that's made up. He's not a myth. He's real. He is human. Again, one of the things that strikes me about reading this scripture that's 2,000 years old is how today, in 2020, you still have some people saying these kinds of things. Jesus is just a story made up by the Christians. You know, there's even people who are scholars who read the New Testament and teach people, well, you know, this is not actually what Jesus said. This is not actually what happened because the early church made up all of these stories. And some people are like, well, he has a PhD. He's, got, he, he's smart. He must know than me, more than me. I should believe him. And it throws people into confusion. Is Jesus real? Was he really a human being? And I, for one, love that John pulls the eyewitness uh, tag and says, yeah, I've seen him. I've touched him. He's real. He's fully human. And one of the beautiful things about the fact that Jesus was fully human is that means that Jesus knows exactly how I feel. Because he's, he's not just some God out there. He, if he's human, and he is, that means he's experienced what humans experience. That means uh, temptation. That means you know, hunger. That means tired. That means um, frustrated from the way things are going. Jesus felt frustration. You can read it and see it in the New Testament. Jesus felt anger. Jesus felt hunger. Some of you are like, Jesus got angry? Read your New Testament. Jesus was fully human. He experienced everything that we experience. And the writer to the Hebrews, just before this book, says that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was not God who just borrowed a human body. He was not God who just appeared to be human. He was fully human. In those days, there was a philosophy called the Gnosticism that still is around today in some of the New Age spirituality. Um, You'll see, it's amazing. It's, it's, It's hung around all these years where people are denying that Jesus was actually human. John says he was, but he's not just human. He also says, He is, in the very first verse, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. What's he saying? That, you know, just like he wrote in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John's echoing that and saying this Jesus has always existed. From the very beginning, he was with the Father. In other words, he is saying he is divine. He's he's God. He, He was never created 
He's always been, and I, this is just hard to get my hands around. Jesus has always existed. God has always existed. Yes. See, can you explain that to me? Because I can't get my hands around eternity. What do you mean there's, there's never been a beginning? Can anybody else explain that to me? You know, to me, everything has a beginning, but not God. I, I, even as I say that, I'm like, what? He's, he's, he's always been, yep. When did he start being? He's always been, and he'll always be. He is the eternal, existent God. That is crazy. And John says, that God that has existed for all eternity, that's Jesus. And you say, well, wait, wait a minute, I thought, you know, there's God, and then there's Jesus. So John wants us to be real clear. As you read through this letter, you're going to see that God has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Or if you're more comfortable with this, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's, it's what the Bible teaches that God, who's one God, has revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what we're seeing here is that this Jesus who has existed from all eternity with the Father, he is life itself. He's always existed. He doesn't need anything to give him life. He doesn't need oxygen. He is life. All other life finds its source in Jesus Christ. Everything that has been created, Paul tells us in Colossians, has been created in Jesus, through Jesus. This eternal God who's always existed is life itself. Therefore, he has the ability to give you life and make life worth living. See, it's not just 2,000 years ago, and it's not just today. Everyone who's ever lived has struggled with, where do you find life? Most people who think about this realize that existence, breathing, is not the same thing as being full of life. You can be alive, but be dead inside. Ever been there? I can breathe, I, I can eat, I can drink. I'm, I'm technically alive, but I'm, I'm dead inside. Jesus is life itself, and he gives life. And this is why it's so important that, that John helps us see that Jesus is real, that he's human, and that he's divine. He's not part human and part divine. He's not like 75% human or 75% divine. He's 100% human and he's 100% God. And you say, well, that's 200%. I know. I, I, just like I can't explain how he could always exist, I also can't explain rationally in my little pea brain mind how Jesus can be fully God and fully my man and other people have said, I can't explain it. And they've said, since I can't explain it, it can't be true. Do you see how arrogant that is? If I can't explain it, it must not be true. How about this? I love that there's things about God I can't explain. I want a God who's bigger than what I can explain, who fits into my rational algorithms. I want a God who's bigger. Now, I didn't create him, but as I read the Bible, I see a God who's made himself flesh, a God who's made himself real. I see a man, Jesus, who's fully God and fully man, and I'm like, wow, I wanna worship a God like that. I want a God bigger than my problems. Anybody else? <laughs> and so when I read the Bible, I'm like, whoa. I mean, he's fully God and he's fully man? He's the only one in history like that. If I, can I be redundant? He's totally unique. Really, you don't need the word totally. He's absolutely, totally unique. That's what unique is. There's no one like him. And more importantly, that means that when this human who is divine, when this human, Jesus, who's perfect, when he dies, wait, wait, wait you just said he was, he was divine. Yes, you read your Bible, read, and he, this is even in the history books, Jesus died on a cross, John says, I saw him. When he died and was raised from the dead, again, John saw, said, I saw him. That unique individual, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, when he dies, his death is unlike anyone in history. 
That means that I can put my faith in Jesus, believing that the Bible teaches that when Jesus died, he took all the sins of the world upon his human body, upon his soul, and I'm weighing down here because sometimes I think Jesus really didn't die from the, the blood that he lost on the cross. I mean, he did. But I also think that he died from a crushed soul because Jesus was carrying all the weight of the sin of the world. All the sins that had been committed up to his time 2,000 years ago, all the sins that were being committed by the Romans who put him to death and by the Jewish leaders who, who put him to death, and all the sins you and I have committed and everyone else has committed throughout eternity, all of that sin upon the human body of Jesus who because he's also divine, took all of that sin and put it to death, went to the grave, was in the grave for three days, and when he was raised with that, he broke the power of sin. Nobody else's death has the power to break the power of sin. That's what we're shouting about. Yeah, I know, I know. What we, a lot of people we've sent to Lorraine who are the shouters and the ameners, we, I, need, I need you guys to shout about something like this, because this is what we're shouting about. When he broke the power of sin and death, was raised from the dead, it's like, that means my sins can be forgiven. See, if Jesus was just a good man, just human, and the best human ever, his death doesn't have the power to take my sin. You know, Mother Teresa, great woman, they say. Billy Graham, you know, two, these are great people, but their death is just a tragedy. Their death can't pay the penalty for other human sins. But because Jesus is not just human, he's also divine. When he died, he took my sin and put it to death. He took your sin and he put it to death. And we are being raised to new life. See, it's the reason why John wants us to know that Jesus is real, that he's fully human and fully divine, because he alone is the one who can save us. <laughs> That's right. Nobody else can do that. Jesus, he alone can save us. Christ alone. Wow, that's awesome. And that is the Jesus that John is proclaiming. He goes, I want you guys to remember this. Because I've told you this before, because he's writing to churches. And I want you to remember this. Those of us who are doing, those of you who are teaching false doctrine, you know, they had fake news back then, just like we do. They had persuasive, shiny-teethed, perfect hair, persuasive speakers. I, I get the feeling that John wasn't that persuasive because, you know, he saw Jesus. He is pastoring these churches, and from within the very church he's pastoring, persuasive, slick-tongued, perfect hair um, teachers were convincing people, don't listen to John, you know, he's... he's not really that big of a deal. Listen to me. And in those days, just like today, it doesn't matter whether you speak truth to a lot of people. What matters is how good you are at it. And if you're smooth, and if you're good, and if you're you know, uh, one of these amazing speakers, you can actually say things that aren't true, and people will go, oh. Amazing, it's so true. And today, with our fake news and our false truths and everybody having their own truth, people don't know what to believe. It's not new. It's what John was wrestling about. They just didn't have the internet to deal with. And so John goes, guys, it's all about Jesus and you gotta get it right about who Jesus is. This idea of your own personal truth. Everybody has their own truth. No, there is objective truth. And Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Personal truth, your own truth is a lie. It's a deceitful scheme from the evil one to, lift, to have people think that, hey, I can decide what I Belief and my belief and my truth is just as important as yours. I mean, even just the whole idea of my truth. We use that phrase in society today. 
How, how arrogant as if I decide what is true. Well, that's exactly what our culture teaches. And that's what they were teaching in John's day. See how relevant this is to today? I mean, we, we need truth or the world doesn't operate. I mean, I, I've used this example before. Gravity. You can say all day long, I don't believe in gravity. Gravity doesn't work for me. That's your truth. Fine. Walk off a cliff. See how your truth works. I don't believe in gravity. Well, I do now. I do now. Why? Because you ran smack into truth. Objective truth. Really, society, relationships, nothing can operate if everybody has their own truth about what's true and what's not. John says, I know these guys are slick. I know they're smooth. But I saw him. I heard him. I touched him. He's real. Listen to him. And and listen to me because I saw him with my own eyes. And I want you to know these things so that, I don't know if you noticed this phrase, it shows up twice in our verses. I'm telling you these things, John says, so that, so that what? So that you may have fellowship with us. Oh, so that you may fully share our joy. Two so that's. One of them is so that you can have fellowship. What does he mean when he says you can have fellowship with us? He means so we can be connected. So we can um, have this, this unity around truth And that unity, that connectedness, that fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. Now, this is fascinating. Fellowship's about connected relationships. It's about, you know, the the intimacy and the the, the relationship that a great team has, that a great family has, that you feel with somebody when you're on the same page with them. It's so good. But this is not just fellowship of some team, some fellowship of some family. This is fellowship with the Father, (laughs) right? And his son, Jesus. And when John uses father language and son language, he's talking about more than fellowship. He's talking about family. He's talking about family. We want you to know the truth about Jesus, and we want you to know the joy of being in the family of God. This, This is what the church is, John writes. And I want to say to you in Lorraine, this is what the church is. It's the family of God. I want to remind all of us and all of our campuses, this is what the church is. It's the family of God that's all about Jesus. And this is what John wants us to see. Our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. We are part of the family of God. <laughs> I, uh, years ago, I knew a guy who was on the staff of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And um, he got me tickets one time to a game, and uh, I was, uh, you know, it was just great tickets right next to the tunnel when you go, you know, the players go in and out, and I'm like, this is sweet, you know, there's LeBron, hey. This was the first time LeBron was here. And, um, and so I'm, you know, after, after the game, I'm kind of hanging out in a restricted area, and this big woman comes up to me, and she goes, I'm sorry, you can't be in here. How did you get in here? And I, I remembered they gave me a pass, and so I pulled the pass, I, I, it was a lanyard, around my neck, and I pulled out, and she was like, oh, you family. <laughs> That's what she said. She goes, oh, you family, welcome. And then she goes, did you know there's food back there? And so she, she takes me back to another restricted area, and there's food, because I'm family. And I'll never forget her just, her, she, everything changed when she said, saw the past, and saw the lanyard, and now you family. This, this is what John is saying. He goes, if you believe in Jesus Christ, and who he is as the savior of the world, that he died on the cross for your sins. You put your trust in him. You family. You are part of the family of God. Isn't that wonderful? And that's the church. No matter what campus you're worshiping in, that's the church. It's the family of God. And when John talks like this about the father, he goes, oh, this father. John, 1 John 3, 1. See how very much our father loves us, this family is fathered by a God who loves us like crazy. You know, my father was a great father, but he wasn't perfect. You may have had a good father, you may have had a bad father, but don't judge our heavenly father merely by your earthly father because our heavenly father loves us 
perfectly. And I, and I, I told some people earlier, the, the thing that's, cra- that's crazy about God's love is that God knows everything about us and still loves us. He, you know, my wife knows a lot about me, but she doesn't know everything. There's things I've thought over the years that she doesn't know about. My mom knows a lot about me. Sometimes it freaks me out. But she doesn't know everything about me. I think she knows everything I did, but she doesn't know everything I think. Even though I started to believe that as a kid, I'm like, she, she can read my mind. Nobody knows everything about you, what you've thought, what you've done when no one else was around. But God, he knows everything about you, and he loves you. Come on! That's awesome, isn't it? Or am I talking to a bunch of perfect people? No, I'm not. All of us have got stuff in the skeletons in the closet. All of us have got things we don't want anybody else to know. God knows, and he says, I love you. I know you, and I love you. That is is awesome. We are loved by the Father. So we sang today how great the Father's love is, how rich, what a treasure, how deep and high and wide is the love of God, right? John never got over that. And I don't ever want to get over that I am fully known and fully loved by God. And I want every one of you to be gripped by that because that'll change your life. And you say, well, just because I know I'm loved? Well, yes, but he says, he says in, in this next verse, our fellowship with the Father and with the Son, so we're loved by the Father and we're saved by the Son. This is where, this is where John 3, 16 comes from. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only Son to die on the cross for our sins. That's where that whole idea comes from. So I'm loved by the Father. You're loved by the Father and saved by the Son. And the church, the church is all those people who are gathered who realize, wow, God loves me. The church is all those people who are gathered with the truth that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And the church is that place where we invite people to experience that love. Oh, you've got to hear about Jesus. You've got to know about this love, this idea of being loved by the Father and saved by the Son because this creates a family of connected, supportive relationships. The church is the family of God. It is a supportive, connective fellowship with each other because we have fellowship with God. And so these relationships are, are sacred relationships. The church is not a, a group of people. It is a group of people who are united under the love of God and the death and resurrection of Christ. And that makes the church the most unique organization in the world. And really, we're, we're not an organization. We're an organism. We're, Paul says you're the body of Christ. Isn't that a crazy phrase? That the church is the body of Christ. This fellowship that we have together is intimate. It's it's a connectedness that is, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, is a connectedness that is really mirrored in a beautiful way in our physical bodies. Paul says that each of you are a part of the body of Christ. He never says to one person, like this, this is a plural. There's never been one person who's the body of Christ except for Jesus. But you put all of us together, and together we're the body. So, he, so Paul says, one of you is a nose, one of you is an ear, one of you is an elbow, one of you is an eye. This kind of gets kind of funny after a while. One of you is a kneecap. You know, which one am I? Don't you tell me, I'll decide. But, you know, we all have, you know, these quirks about us, but you put us together and we form the body of Christ. Why? Because we decided that we wanted to be the body of Christ? No, because we're united by the Father and the, and the Son, and putting our faith in him, the Holy Spirit does this mystical, miraculous, connected thing. And you, I have been in Vietnam. I have been in, in, in uh, um, 
in Ecuador. I've been in El Salvador. I've been in the Dominican Republic. I've been all over the world and met a Christian and instantly felt connected. Anybody else felt that? It's like, what was that about? I just met you. That's because we're united by the Holy Spirit because we have one Father and we're, we're saved by Jesus Christ. This, this fellowship with us is because of the fellowship with the Son and the Father. The Father and the Son make up this this uniting connectedness along with the Holy Spirit that makes the church so unique. Now, just like every other body, everybody has problems. Everybody, everybody has problems. And there's, I got problems with my body that I don't want you to know about. And we all have parts of our bodies that are messed up. This is true for the church. There is no perfect church. You know, if you're church shopping and trying to find the perfect one, well, if, you, if there are even one that was existed, as soon as you got there, it's no longer perfect. You know, just in case you're thinking, wow, you know, he, he's, he's one of those smooth speakers. He, he must be perfect. <laughs> Ask somebody who knows me. They'll tell you real quick, oh, yeah, he's nothing but, he's hardly anything but perfect. But that's okay. I never tried to pretend to be perfect. I'm a human just like you who is full of sin and faults and failures and warts and all kinds of problems, but I'm loved by the Father and I put my faith in the Son so I'm forgiven and filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm on a journey to become more and more like Christ. And so are you. Join us in the journey because this is where God is taking us. We're saved And then we begin to grow. We're saved by Jesus, by putting our faith in Jesus' death on the cross. And then we grow in Jesus. We're saved by Jesus. We grow in Jesus. Hey, it's all about Jesus. That's exactly right. The church, we're back to the beginning now. The church is all about Jesus. We're following him. The church is is, is disciples. There's another way of talking about it. The church is disciples. That means people who are followers. A disciple, this is not in your notes, but you can write it down. A disciple is someone who's following Jesus to learn from Jesus to become like Jesus. A disciple is someone who's following Jesus to learn from Jesus to become like Jesus. We're following Jesus. That's who we are as a church. And we invite you to join us. You say, well, I don't know a whole lot about Jesus. That's cool. When I first started, I didn't either. So I started exploring Jesus and discovering who he was. And the more I discovered, the more I wanted to follow, the more I fell in love with Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. And, And a lot of people around here do. We don't just talk about Jesus. We love him. He's changed our lives. That's what we're about here. We love Jesus. And the more we follow him, the more we love him, the more we wanna share with you, that's why, that's why we've started all of these campuses, because we want as many people as possible to know about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Life, the church, eternity, it's all about Jesus. And we want as many people as possible to know. So those of you who are coming to Lorraine for the first time, those of you who are visiting our campuses and coming to our campuses for the first time, other places, this is what we're about. And we want to invite you to join us in following Jesus. And we want to invite you to join us in loving Jesus. And we want to invite you in, 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 uh, to share Jesus with others. Because Jesus changed our lives. He gave us life. And we want as many people as possible to know that. Amen? Because it's all about Jesus. So as you leave today, uh, when we talk about following Jesus, we talk about literally, the disciples literally picked up one foot after another and followed Jesus wherever he went. Today, we still use that same language, following Jesus, taking steps to follow Jesus. And we're always asking, what's our next step? I'm asking, as the lead pastor, I'm asking, what's my next step? And we invite you to ask that question. Every one of you, every one of you, I don't care whether this is the first time you've heard about Jesus or whether you've been a Christian for 70 years. We all have next steps, and we want to take those. And, you know, you're going to hear more about this, this brochure. There's one available at, 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 on all of our campuses for you, so don't, you don't think you need to leave it there. Take one, and in this brochure, it'll help you 
Those of you who don't know much about Jesus, you want to explore him, this pamphlet will help you know how do I explore Jesus because this guy's all spitting and sweating and crazy about him. There must be something going on. You can explore Jesus. Those of you who already are followers of Jesus, you've surrendered your life to him, you're disciples of Jesus, you want to grow in Jesus, that brochure will give you some ideas about some next steps because all of us are taking steps and following Jesus. And we, and we invite you, be a part of the family. Let's go change the world for the glory of God. Not because we've got some you know, change the world thing going on, because we wanna love Jesus and love others like Jesus, and that love will change our world. One person at a time. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you've changed my life, and I just want to say thank you. And it's in Christ alone that I've discovered salvation, new life. And there's thousands, millions like me whose lives have been changed. Lord, I pray today as each one of us think about what is our next step as we explore you, as we follow you, you would fill us with this love that we would tell others about Jesus. And Lord Jesus, you would use us to bring others into this family of love, this family of God, this, this family that cares for each other, this family that loves each other. God, forgive us our sins. Forgive us for our failures. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your love. And it's in Christ alone that we put our trust. We find our hope, our strength, our life in you. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen.